Hello, welcome to this excerpt from one of our Cosmic Shamble shows. This was Nine Lessons and Carols for Curious People online. Uh, we put our shows online when we decided to postpone the theatre shows due to the rapid rise in COVID. You can see the full version of this show online, by the way, which includes things like uh, an interview with uh, Helen Sharman, Britain's first astronaut, and uh, also people like Chris Lintart and Susie Gage and Dean Bennett and Helen Chersky. And what we've actually got for you now is uh, Professor Christina Pargel, uh, uh, from UCL, um, who is one of those people who has really been incredibly useful in keeping us informed uh, about COVID and about the pandemic situation. And uh, we had a conversation about thoughts over how to deal with some of the problems that arrive with uh, the rapid rising in COVID over the Christmas period. So I hope you find this useful and do go to cosmicshambles.com to find lots of other stuff that we've done also about COVID and many other subjects as well about COVID and about Hawkwind and about the film Dead of Night. And, uh, yeah, there's all manner of things we've done. But anyway, I hope you find this useful. So I suppose the first thing, you know, this, this seems certainly for us bystanders to have moved very, very quickly in terms of over the last week uh, in in trying to work out what decisions are the right things to do over Christmas. So so initially, you know, what we've seen, first of all, if I can ask you, I, I saw a thing that I think was from a research done by Imperial, which was saying that this idea uh, that the new strain is somehow a much more watered down strain compared to Delta, that from the Imperial research, that that's not true. Well, there's no evidence that it's true. I mean, it's a bit difficult because they're only they only had about 28 hospitalizations in their data set from the Omicron cases. And so from that, they could compare it, but they're pretty sure that it's certainly not any milder than 50% and it's not any worse than 50%. That's kind of how you have to think of it. Um, I think what's happened is that everyone was looking at South Africa being like, oh my God, they've got far fewer hospitalizations than they did in previous waves. But effectively, I think what's happened there is that their most recent wave was to their last wave and that our Delta wave was to the Alpha wave and that they built up a lot of immunity and that's what's protecting them. It's not anything particularly intrinsic about Omicron. So we've got no real reason to think that Omicron is going to be better. I mean, I hope it is because if it isn't, we're in much worse trouble. But it has to be about 10 times milder for it to to kind of be OK, given the number of cases. And it's unlikely to be that scale of mildness. So in terms of your ad advice initially, in terms of what we should perhaps be cutting out at the moment in terms of, you know, the build up to Christmas, are there certain things you would say, Do you know what, if you've got these plans, I would postpone them for a while. I mean, like this weekend, I have to tell you, I'm I just feel really frustrated because, you know, Omicron's three weeks old. And I I think that's just crazy. Like we've never seen anything spread like this. It makes Delta look like a complete like slow coach. Um, but within about a week of knowing about Omicron, in fact, earlier than that, we could see it doubling every three days in South Africa. It's not like we didn't know the speed of it doubling. We knew it was here. And so, you know, within a week, I was saying, an independent stage was saying, you know, we have to start doing plan B at minimum. We have to restrict contacts. We have to start thinking about meeting outside. Um, we have to do work from home. That waited. And then by the time plan B came in, it was clear that that might have worked against Delta. It was never going to work against this. And then, you know, <laughs> and then, Last week we were saying, you know, we really have to do a lot more than what we're doing. We have to think about um, restricting hospitality. We have to think about restricting indoor meetings, restricting household mixing. That, that nothing happened. And then on Wednesday we ended up saying, look, we've wasted the opportunity to slow it down. Um, now we just need a circuit break. And if we do it now, that gives us 10 days to Christmas. And hopefully that will allow Christmas mixing. We're now five days in. And the problem with doing that is that it has been doubling less than every two days. And so if you wait a week, it's more than eight times worse. And 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 I think what's scary is that by the time that hits hospitals, and remember there's like two weeks between infection and needing hospital, if it is severe, then admissions are going to be doubling every two days. And there's literally nothing you can do about it because the infections have happened. There's absolutely nothing you can do about it. And that's why everyone is scared. Now, it could be that it's peaked. It could be that growth is slowing. It could be that it's milder. 
but if we're wrong then we're screwed and so that's that's kind of the situation right now and how much has this been confused by so, so it, it strikes me that what i understand and you might well correct me is that there's a lot of it in london and so it's taking off far more quickly in london than the like there's a country number there's a country rate of increase which is a lot but actually in the places where it's already taken hold it's taking off much much faster and there's there's this kind of confusion between the average for the country of how bad it is so and the average for specific places so that that is not true <laughs> okay thank you it's, wherever wherever it's taken off it's taken off as quickly as anywhere else every region in the country is doubling um, within 1.5 to two days. But in terms of case numbers, because is London, it but, seems like the numbers in London are but that's higher. Be, but that's because, because we've got a high background of Delta, right? We ha we're flat at about 45,000 cases of Delta a day in England. That's really, really high. When Omicron's 2,000 cases and it moves to 4,000, your overall case numbers are going from 47 to 49, right? It's not a big change. Once it's over 50% and you've got, you know, 10,000 cases like you have in London, then you're you're making a really big difference. So once it's dominant, you'll start seeing the big rises. It's now dominant in every single region in England apart from the northeast, and you will see exactly the same thing happening. <laughs> um, so that's that's what's that's the problem almost is that is that because we've had these really high levels of delta, it's it's obscured how quickly it's rising. Um, and the issue the issue now is that we're coming up to the limits of our testing capacity and it's not really clear that we can test more than the equivalent of about 100,000 cases a day. And so then we actually don't know what's going to happen. And we're not going to know that um, until it's about to hit our hospitals. So so we're in kind of the situation where very soon we're going to lose track of what's happening. And, and that's also quite scary. So would you can oh. ask in, in terms of this is obviously, you know, personal advice that, that um, would you say the best thing to do now? if you have the option is to really limit the amount that you leave the house to uh you know maybe you need to go to the shops or something like that but to basically cut out um the all non-essential uh mixing yeah yeah for sure like we've done it now um but you no know, not least because in the last two days i've had five friends all separate all of whose Christmas plans are now ruined because they were either them or household members tested positive. Like it is, like London is the first place, you know, we are a few days ahead, but I can tell you this, this, it just, I've never seen anything like it. You know, a friend of mine, as is the case, anecdote, but um, it kind of explains how difficult it is. She went to a Christmas party last Saturday, 11 people, all double vaccinated, three boosted, um, windows open. All did a la all did lateral flow tests beforehand. A um, two days later, one of them tested positive. Didn't know at the time. Every single person at that party now has COVID, and not just COVID, but they all have symptoms. So, and then you just kind of if it infects everybody with those level of precautions. Basically, if you're going inside and you're meeting people, if they don't have COVID, you're fine. If they do have COVID, you're very likely to get it. And, and that's the situation. So in terms of other things, so I'm, I'm going to ask very boring questions. They're just the boring kind of pragmatic questions, which is, for instance, people who are thinking of uh, journeying to see members of their family, perhaps using trains or public transport, etc. Uh, for Christmas, would you suggest that they put that off for the time being? Thinking also that I presume that public transport, for instance, is highly likely to be busier because there are going to be people who are not able to turn up for work. So I presume there'll be fewer trains, etc. So I think it is a really difficult one because this is the second year, right? Mm. Um, and many people, you know, there, there is a mental health side to it as well. So I guess what I would say is if you limit your contacts now, that's a week till Christmas, and actually that in its own means you're you're much much less likely to be infected or infectious by the weekend um so that's that's already a very very safe thing to do now not everybody is in a position to do that so you know in some ways being in a position to isolate for for a week is quite a privileged position um but i think the difference between this year and last year is that is that most vulnerable people have now been boosted and so i think there is there is a case for talking to your family and seeing what people are comfortable with and how you can plan to be safer. So you could, for instance, say, um, 
we'll meet but we'll only be inside for this limited amount of time or we'll try and do some outdoor activities or we're not going to be doing singing I don't know whatever it is people do but you know there are things you can do um but I think that has to be negotiated within each family and there shouldn't no one should feel under any pressure to do things um and how you have those conversations can be quite can be quite tricky um and I would say do the lateral flow tests do them several times in the run-up because then you're much more likely to catch something if you you know if you are infectious but if you have any kind of symptom at all like the mildest cold symptom like the the thing is it starts and it's so mild like you know I had COVID and the beginning of last month <clears throat> and at the beginning it's so mild that you just don't realize you're sick and then later on you go oh maybe that you know so it, like for people some people it's a very very mild sore throat or a, a very light ticklish cough that they think might just be asthma you know like it's that kind of level but if you have anything then please don't go like please don't go because that that is often the first sign of covid and it and you don't actually feel properly rough for two days and then you might get a test right but then you've been infecting people if you've been mixing so that's the kind of advice i give i feel i should i i mean it's another anecdote but i also had covid a month ago and I didn't have any of the symptoms on the list, right? I just mm. felt a bit off. And and I thought I was doing everything right, but it didn't occur to me that feeling just a bit off could be COVID. And I, I learned a lesson because it could be. So if you're feeling just a bit off, get a test. Never mind. Yeah. I, I mean, I'm not yeah. a doctor, but the, the official, because I went down the official list of symptoms, all the long list, and went, well, I haven't, haven't really got any of those. And so I didn't get a PCR test until three days later. And I should have done yeah and and there are now kind of reports coming out that the omicron symptoms are might be a bit different and especially if you're boosted um it might be a bit it might be a bit different you know if you're vaccinated then you tend you can have might maybe milder symptoms children often have gastro symptoms they often feel sick or have diarrhea in children so you look out for that um and yeah i mean just basically if if there's anything that makes you think you might not be well for whatever reason then just don't don't do it it's not i just don't think it's worth it um yeah it, it's it's a, it's a difficult time and and it's hard to imagine that we're here again you know it is it's hard it's hard to be here mm. Is that uh, just going back on the public transport thing? So, for instance, you know, busy trains, if you are wearing a mask, if you're taking precautions, if maybe, you you know, you're trying to make sure that you, you have the choice that you're not sat in a, is a busy, uh, you know, too busy an area, because um, that, that was the thing that worried me was that journey where I mean when I was doing the 100 bookshop tour I kept kind of thinking about you know I generally did the whole thing in the vestibule because so few people were wearing masks at that point as well. Um, you know, d- d- what do we know about the risks there, for instance? I mean, I don't think anyone's been able to disentangle um, public transport from everything else because generally you're using it to go to and from places <laughs> where you're mixing. So um, I think there was one study that showed that subways were associated with high risk. Um, obviously wear a mask, but try and get an FFP2 mask, they're called, that have filtration in them because they actually filter out aerosols. So they not only protect others, but they also protect you. But it has to fit well, like it, like when you breathe in, it has to. You can kind of should be able to feel it sucking against your face. It's that kind of fit you're looking for. Um, and don't don't eat or drink. I mean, that sounds horrible, but you know, if you're taking your mask off to have to have a drink and and eat food, then it's kind of, I mean, it it kind of negates the point of it. I mean, really. I mean, and, and I would say if it was a lower risk situation, then fine. But it's not it's not a, it's not a low risk situation right now. Like it's, the prevalence is so high. Well, thank you so much for, for joining us, and making those things uh, clear, because I think that this is one of the problems is, you know, we, we whenever I see people like you and there's various people, obviously, that I've been fortunate to be pointing in the right direction. But it still feels that within the mass media messages like what you just said to us and a lot of the stuff from other people who, you know, part of uh, Sage Independent Sage just aren't really making it out there. Well, I think it's partly people don't you know it's no it's not a message anyone wants to hear um and I I kind of just wonder whether whether we have the power to do something like have two or three bank holidays in February and say let's let's just move it um and give people something to look forward to 
because I mean I'm I I'm I'm desperate to have Christmas like I, I don't mm. want to do it my parents are elderly is it going to be their last one you know those are the thoughts that go through your head you know what risk are they prepared to take what risk am I prepared to take they have boosted you know like and I think people do have to make those decisions and I'm very reluctant to say no one should meet but the truth is it is it, it isn't risk-free it just isn't it's not it's going to be very difficult to have a safe Christmas no. And just on that point, actually, because the one thing that I I think many people have thought is that well, at least we can do things outside. Is that still reasonable, do you think? Does Is there any evidence on whether outside is still as OK as it was? Yes, outside is very OK, um, particularly in the daytime, because UV light kills COVID quite quickly. Um, and but you do have to have your distance. So if you're if you're literally walking really close to someone and talking at each other or you're sitting opposite each other, then then you will have breath coming at you and it gets dispersed quickly. But it's still a bit of a risk, especially because, you know, Omicron is quite transmissible. Um, but like side by side walking should be fine. You know, if you're in a massive crowd or hugging and singing and stuff, then that is that is going to be more dangerous. But but in general, outside is way safer than inside. And that that stays the case. Thank you so much for joining us, uh, Professor Christine Pagel. Uh, Christine Pagel is uh, go and find her stuff that is on. You're regularly Twitter, on Twitter and, often, and often retweeting, retweeting uh, good, information good information as well as, well as, you, well as know, you know. So, so that's, that's the thing. Is thing is try, is try and find as many, as many people, people who are, who, are uh, who, have, who have you know you, you, know, know, you know from a critical, from a critical thinking perspective thinking. are more likely to be close up to actually the latest information because of course as as you were just explaining, you know, Christina, these it, it's rapid change in terms of understanding what is going on. Yeah, you... I mean, don't just don't plan more than 10 days ahead because who I just don't know what's going to happen. I think no one knows. So <laughs> just keep your plans small. We've entered that Barry Cryer yeah. thing where Barry Cryer says, I'm so old now that I never risk buying green bananas. <laughs> um, so uh, thank you so much. And I do hope that whatever kind of Christmas you are able to have is a happy Christmas. And I, we should say to everyone, you know, one of the, as we were saying before, one, one of the uh, charities we're giving to is, is is Maytree, which is a really great mental health uh, charity for people who've reached quite extreme positions with their mental health. But of course, there's so many charities out there and, and do, you know, look up the numbers, make sure you communicate with people. If you are, if it's beginning to hit you hard, and I know it's hit some people very hard already you know make sure that you reach out because there are lots of people out there who are ready to listen to you as well so um thank you again uh christina for joining us um